a couple of months ago, I participated in my last commencement ceremony at Concordia University in Portland. And uh, probably all of you know that commencement ceremonies are famous for speeches that send the graduating students out with all kinds of wisdom that's aimed at helping them to know how to make the transition from college and take on the challenges of life and the world after being a student. But today I want to wonder out loud what it might be like if the spirit or the invited commencement speaker how might the Spirit lead all of us into knowledge of life and good things, as the writer of uh, the Gospel of John says in chapter 14 that we just heard? How might he lead us into all this if he were the speaker at a commencement ceremony? And what, in the end, is truly the wisdom of life that he would lead us into? Because isn't that what we would expect the Spirit to say? So you've heard this said in commencement speeches, follow your heart, find your passion, march to the beat of your own drummer. Take the time to find yourself and become who you truly are. The Spirit says, the heart is deceitful beyond all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it and know its secret motives? Or from Jesus, but I say unto you, anyone who wants to truly find oneself has to lose oneself. To truly live, one has to lay down their own life. Now, I might look young, but I've actually been teaching and working with young people for about 20 years. Ever since I became a Christian. Perhaps my battery is going dead here. Yep. Ever since I became a Christian. I've been working with them. Uh, it wasn't long after my conversion before I took over helping to lead a high school Bible study. And one of the things that I notice regularly with young people is they want desperately to be accepted in their own authentic and individual selves. And at the same time, they want to be part of something bigger than themselves, especially when it comes to their future and the mark that they hope to make upon the world, big or small. I've often found these two desires to be in conflict. As my students get closer to graduation and that anticipation of entering the workaday world gets nearer and nearer, this conflict seems to come to a dramatic Many have been taught throughout their lives the now cliched phrases that encourage them toward the authenticity I've been talking about. Be who you are. March to the beat of your own drummer. Follow your heart. Find your passion. You do you. But as they prepare to launch into the world as an adult with responsibilities, work, bills, and eventually marriage and a family to care for, with a lot of questions. It seems that all the advice to look inside of oneself and to follow one's heart doesn't actually tell a person how to live very well, or how to get along with others, particularly in today's world. While all those cliches sounded lovely, and seemed, at the time, to promise a lot of freedom and opportunity, they didn't offer much real guidance. In particular, they don't say much about what a human life should look like, or what a human life is for. In other words, while all of us have at some point been encouraged to embrace our own unique individuality, we were taught very poorly about how to be part of something bigger than ourselves, or what something of that sort would even look like. The wisdom of the Spirit tells us the wisdom of the Spirit tells us to look elsewhere than 
inside of our own selves for both the truth about ourselves and the direction of our lives. And also what we should do in any given moment. He prompts us to look to the one who created us, who gives us an identity, the moment that he creates us, and who calls us to be part of his grand story of redeeming the world and helping his creation to flourish. St. Paul writes in that passage that you heard a moment ago, let each of you lead the life that God has assigned to which he has called you. The great scholar of human suffering, Viktor Frankl, had a life-changing experience not long after he began his career as a psychologist. He was a Jew, living at the time when the Nazi regime rose to power in Germany, and began systematically to eliminate the Jews of Europe. He was, like many others, interred at a concentration camp and watched many of his own people give up in fact, take their own lives before the Nazis could do it for them in the gas chambers. He noticed, though, that those who survived were the ones who had something to live for. And that something was usually someone or some task that they couldn't bear to abandon. Frankl himself was one of these people as he reflected on his experience later in life, Frankl said that he had not imagined his own life taking the path that it did. Who would, in this case? It's not what he had asked for, nor what he intended for himself. Becoming a scholar of suffering was nowhere on his radar prior to his time in the concentration camp. But he said, it became something upon which I could not turn my back. He concluded that we ought not to seek what we can get out of life, but what life needs from us. It isn't, what do I want from life, but what does life need from me? And in this, I think, Frankl captures the wisdom of the Spirit as it's spoken through St. Paul. We might call that wisdom crooked in the evil way, like a crook, but not straight. Because it isn't what we expect. It doesn't go in a straight line. It doesn't offer a linear, step-by-step -step process toward a solution for some problem that we're trying to solve. It often doesn't make much sense. And it certainly doesn't look attractive. It tends to be the opposite of the supposed wisdom that we tell ourselves and our children in commencement addresses and all during the years they're growing up. We offer a bunch of well-intentioned platitudes, but it's as if we've learned nothing from the Spirit's prompting in life. We, even us Christians, still want to be like those at Babel, people who intend to reach the heavens by their own efforts. And then we want the same for our kids. And so we tell them to live according to the rules of the world. And effectively in doing so, we lie to them. Because those rules make promises that won't actually deliver. Because they can't. We see this strangeness of the Spirit's wisdom in the life of Jesus. Everything there was utterly not as we'd expect. God's ways, as communicated by the Spirit's wisdom and embodied in the life of Jesus, are definitely not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so the logic here is a kind of kingdom logic. It's inverse, it's upside down, it's opposite of what we tend to take for granted. To find oneself, you have to lose yourself. And losing oneself only happens in community, with commitments to move from self to other to service. This is the way that the New York Times columnist David Brooks puts it. Your life is not yours to create, but it has been, as St. Paul said, bought with a price. And so you are not your own. Your life was given by God when you were created in the womb. Your redemption was purchased by Christ 
when he died for your sins on the cross and was raised to life again. You've been engrafted into the community called the body of Christ. You've become branches of the one true vine. Your true and authentic life and identity is hidden in Christ. And discovering it is built into the journey of Christian discipleship and being led by the Spirit as you live together in this community, serving the world through your various and multiple callings. I'd like to add one more thing. Commencement speeches often have a subtle and difficult to detect additional message that they encourage us to believe and live by. You're told subtly and always indirectly. You're told that you will be loved if you are successful, if you achieve much, if you gain significant attention by your accomplishments, experiences, your wealth, and the things that you own. We've not so much as heard this said, as we've been immersed in a world that lives by these rules in a taken-for-granted sort of way. Perhaps you've seen a commercial by the beer brand Dos Equis, which stars the imaginary character of the most interesting man in the world. Everyone wants to be him. And it just so happens that on the rare occasion that he drinks beer, he only drinks Dos Equis. The brilliant marketers who put this series of commercials together captured something that I think is true about us all. Strangely, it has nothing to do with drinking beer. Instead, the deeper message of the commercials has everything to do with the world in which we live, where we interact and engage with others on a daily basis. It has to do with the world in which we try to distinguish ourselves from those others as different as unique. And one of the primary ways that we do this is through how we appear to others. But it's more than just standing out as a unique product or a unique person. The commercials featuring the most interesting man in the world also contain a refrain that we hear over and over again on the invisible airwaves of the culture in which we live. And it comes to us as a rule, a command, an imperative. To be someone, to be unique, you must be interesting. To be interesting is to garner attention of a certain kind. Interest generates a response in others. They look at us and find us attractive or desirable in some way, and therefore acceptable and affirmable. It's almost as if we're not yet fully human, not worthy of life itself, we might say, until we are interesting. The late writer David Foster Wallace calls it being watchable. Are we entertaining? Are we impressive? Are we worth looking at? Are our experiences and possessions interesting and enviable? There's a pressure that comes with this imperative to be interesting. It functions like a tyrant. We can't get out from under its domination. Most of the time, we don't want to. We simply go along with it, taking it for granted that this is just the way things are. The trouble with this search for affirmation, the cultural imperative to be interesting and watchable is, I think, twofold. First, we live in an age of dual existence. So on the one hand, we've got our embodied, real, flesh and blood lives through which we engage with others. And on the other hand, we have our digitized, idealized projections of ourselves online through avatars, images, texts, sexts, comments, and so on. And the 
This exacerbates the various ways that we seek to affirm, to be affirmed, and to be recognized. And while it's normal for humans to need such affirmation for a healthy life, I saw numerous babies in the room during the two services this morning. Right? Neglecting a baby is going to cause that child to, in a sense, waste away and eventually die. We all need affirmation. But we live in an age when we can and often do seek affirmation around every corner. So second, I think because we search for affirmation of our lives and our identity so prolifically, we're not careful about what kind of affirmation is actually good for us and what kind is not. And as a result, we're often beleaguered by the constant pressure to appear interesting and watchable, worthy, even. And furthermore, we're constantly comparing our own lives to others to see if we're as happy as they are, if we're having the same kinds of amazing experiences as they are, if we're wearing the right clothes or driving the right cars or eating at the right places or hashtagging the right causes and on and on. And this comparison makes us sad. For some of us, it makes us depressed. And for a few of us, it makes us question whether our lives are worthy, whether we should actually remain alive at all. Who am I? We wonder, should I even be? What if all of our efforts to make ourselves acceptable before other humans might in fact be some kind of replacement for a deeper spiritual problem that we're all trying to solve? To put it another way, what if, if in fact we can make others see us as worthwhile, watchable, desirable and attractive in some way? What if we use the evidence of our wide social acceptability as some kind of leverage for God himself, suggesting that, well, since all these humans find me acceptable, how can you think otherwise, God? What we're after here is trying to deal with a deeper fear. More than affirmation and acceptability, we wonder if we are lovable. Even more, we wonder if we are loved. It's a fear that returns us to the garden right there with Adam and Eve. But we realize there are things about ourselves that we don't like, but that we can't fix. And in the garden, we thought we needed to cover all of this up. We were naked, and we thought no one would love us if they knew who we really were, what we actually think, what we've really done. We even try to hide from God. So all this work to become interesting and affirmable is just an effort to cover ourselves and to hide. Am I lovable? We ask. Do you love me? Will you still love me if you know this about me? How can you love me, God, even when I haven't loved you? If the Holy Spirit were a commencement speaker, he would say to you these words. You don't have to work so hard. I know that it's really exhausting. He would tell us about the hound of heaven who chases you down like a lovesick dog that's lost its owner, only to tackle us finally in the embrace of an unconditional, joy-filled love from a heart that's overflowing because what was lost has finally been found. He would tell us of the inverse logic of being a child of the kingdom and he would say this to you, 
My child, there is nothing more to do. You were loved before you ever knew it. You've been loved before the moment of your own creation. There's no more pressure. No more you have tos or you musts. No more need for efforts to make yourself acceptable, lovable, affirmable. Instead, there's only freedom and rest. Rest from the task of creating our own identity and making ourselves acceptable to others and to God. In Christ, it has been done. He said it himself, it is finished. And so the Spirit says so to you. You are loved. And you are accepted by the very creator of all things. He is the one who gives you that next breath you inhale now, that next heartbeat that you feel pounding in your chest. He's the one who knit you together, who knows all the hairs on your head, who loved you, for you knew what love is. Let us live by the inverse logic of the Spirit. For he guides us into all knowledge, giving us wisdom for life that will carry us through every moment and into eternity. God grants this to us because of Jesus. Amen.